Okay, I think we're gonna just kick start. I'm sure we'll have a few people um, join as we sort of go through um, coming to the end of the day. So yeah, hopefully we um, see more faces and, and really wrap the day up um, with, with a useful webinar to everyone. Um, so we're gonna start um, and what this webinar is about is the processes, mindset and technology needed to secure logistics from supply chain cyber risk. From our perspective, we're seeing the landscape growing every single day, um, and it's something that we feel like needs to be addressed, and it's something that we feel like we need to continue educating on. So we've got a, a surprise guest here today. Um, they're gonna give input um, in terms of what they're seeing, what their product can help secure, um, and also look at what we need as a supply chain um, industry really to consider moving forward to become resilient and remain cyber free. I just want to quickly say today's sponsor of the webinar is SALT. So SALT is a leading recruitment uh, global agency and they specialize in the digital mission to create futures that will positively Im impact the global economy. They have consultants around the world which changes lives of people each year by helping them to start new roles, some of the most exciting startups, scale-ups, agencies, and also some of the large global powerhouses as well. So SALT's clients range from household names, multinationals, agencies, system integrators, vendors, and consultancies, all selling or implementing new digital solutions. So I just want to say a massive thank you to Charlotte, who is the Client Services Director, and also Dave Baker, who is a Practice Manager. Those guys have worked closely with us over the past few years and really helped us deliver the best talent to our customers. So I'm just going to introduce um, today's guest, um, Jeremy Morrill, Vice President of Product at Portnox. NetSec ourselves, we are partners with Portnox, and Portnox um, is a network access control solution, which I'm sure Jeremy will come on to shortly. NetSec is a brand, who are we? We're an IT managed services provider uh, based in Wales, and we specialize in networking, servers, infrastructure, cloud and security. So across all of those technologies, we offer managed services, professional services, and also hardware, software, procurement. So we, our aim as a brand is to become one name and to provide all those services under that umbrella. But without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Jeremy. If you want to just give us an introduction of what your role looks like at Portnox and what your product is doing to help secure supply chains and future and the next generation organizations. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Jeremy Moore, and I am the VP of product at uh, Port Knox. Uh, I have a, a, a lengthy background in IT in various different roles and capacities from uh, network engineering, network management, uh, IT director at several uh, large, uh, prominent uh, educational institutions here in the United States. Um, I have been a product manager for uh, more than a dozen years now, working in the, the network space in my capacity here at Fort Knox as the VP of product. Um, we are faced with uh, tackling challenges around uh, securing uh, network, both from external threats as well as from internal threats. Um, so that's my, uh, my, my role here at Fort Knox. Uh, thanks for that, Jeremy. Um, so we're just gonna move on. And really the topics that we're going to cover today, hopefully you all add an insight into that in terms of what we shared so far, but just to quickly recap that, just so you can understand what you're going to take away from today, um, is, is where is the risk within supply chains? How can cyber threats impact your business? And what can be done to reduce the impact if anything was to happen? How can we improve resilience ongoingly? And also the correct mindset for business owners, business leaders, and technical staff to adopt moving forward. So we're just gonna kick off with where's the risks within supply chains. So Jeremy, really keen to sort of see what your thoughts are on this um, and, and what you've seen from your side of the fence being on the technology vendor side. But also I think from our perspective, there's, there's multiple things we need to address. So one of the biggest risks when we think about security is not just ourselves, is also third party service providers. So in the logistics industry, that's something that's heavily used. The supply chain is made up of a number of other companies and ultimately they pose a risk to you as a business. 
physical access. So when we talk about technology, this solves the problems at the software level, at the logical level with the new infrastructure, but physical access is often forgotten about. We have to remember that people trying to perpetrate and attack your infrastructure, your operation, can also do this on a physical level as well. When we look at poor information security practices, this often comes from lower tier suppliers. Often those are the ones who invest the least in cybersecurity, therefore they pose in more risk to you. Software security vulnerabilities in supply chain management or supplier system code. So we'll come on to that shortly, but the statistics show that software is one of the most heavily attacked um, areas within the cyber landscape and that often comes from software providers. How do we know where that software's come from and who's developed it and whether that is safe for us to use on a daily basis? Counterfeit hardware or hardware embedded with malware. Again, this is where third parties come into this. So the hardware on an IT level, which you are purchasing, is the sanitization done on that? And how do you know that there's no risk embedded within that hardware from the manufacturers? And also third party data. So a lot of data, and this is one of the biggest risks we're gonna talk about today, is one controlling data, and also what third parties are doing with that data. Is it being sold? Is it being misinterpreted? And is it being manipulated within your supply chain? So Jeremy, I'm gonna just hand over to you. Um, from our perspective, these, these are really the, the main risks that we're seeing at the moment, um, but, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so people, uh, especially around physical access, people feel like uh, if I put some bars on my windows and locks on my doors, I should be I should be safe uh, from from prying eyes. But the reality is, is like uh, your your wireless networks uh, they transcend beyond the physical uh, walls of your establishment and uh, are a potential attack vector. Uh, there's also the historical uh, walled garden approach, which is that as long as I have firewalls at my perimeter, then my interior should ultimately be safe. But the reality is, is some of the things that you touched on. Uh, earlier around software and security vulnerabilities, any point of access into your environment can be used uh, and uh, by nefarious individuals, hackers, if you will, to gain entry into your environment and make lateral movements, which is why uh, the walled garden approach is antiquated at this particular point in time. And there's the need for micro segmentation. That's basically forcing a policy of zero trust that I trust no one, no one who's both coming from the outside in, as well as those people who managed to make it into the environment itself. And it's about executing uh, the rules of least privilege. You know, what does this system ultimately absolutely need access to in order to function um, and giving it absolutely nothing more than what it needs to function. And that's, that's the basic premise of zero trust and micro segmentation and something that uh, Portnox is uh, proud to be able to provide both from a wireless, a wired, and from a remote connectivity perspective. Yeah, no, that's great. I think you're, you're totally right. And an analogy that we often use is companies adopt a hard shell, but a soft belly approach. And what that really means is just because your outer perimeter is secure, whether that's using firewalls, whether you've put your data in the cloud, that doesn't mean fundamentally once that barrier is, is breached, that behind that is also secure. So I think it'd be great to sort of go into a little bit more depth um, as we go through the webinar to, to understand how Port Knox is developing a product to secure companies in that sense, um, and also how they're taking that cloud first approach to also um, help organizations on that journey. So when we look at supply chain um, cyber incidents, we've done a little bit of research in terms of looking at, in 2022, what were those attacks and what did they look like? And where were they really focused on? Um, and how did companies recover from that? So 66% of cyber attacks in 2022 were reported to be focused on supplier software code. So when we say supplier software code, whether that's a WMS system that you're using or whether that's any sort of software that your company uses on a daily basis. But we talk about WMS because within logistics, that's one of the most heavily used products, whether it's JDA or whether that's hosted in the cloud as well. That, that 
that software is essentially hosted um, and that can be virtualized, that can be um, on hardware and also in the cloud as well. So where we find the issue is software, um, especially software as a service as well, the control is all with the developers of that software and how people, what, what people, I guess, seem to be under the illusion is that because that software and the code behind that has come from a reputable name or source, that that means that they own that code, but often software is actually developed with open source code. So nobody actually owns that and often it's quite hard to trace who's actually developed that. So you need to be asking your suppliers when you're buying WMS or any other system specific to logistics as to where that software has been developed what sanitization has been done, been done on that, and what we can do to proactively monitor that. Because once that software is deployed into your organization, then that becomes your problem and your responsibility just as much as the developers. On another study, um, we found that 58% of supply chain cyber incidents were predominantly rated, related to customer data, and customer data being stolen, um, manipulated, and also really the risk there was increasing over time where customer data was going missing and often are not actually in the cloud. So I think there's really um, an agenda at the moment or a trend where people feel like just putting that data in the cloud is safe. Cloud is really a hosting um, service first and security second. So if that's not on your agenda, forgetting about security is really not the approach to take. Um, and that security wrap and how you secure the cloud is your responsibility ultimately. And one of the last things we found was that 66% of the attacks report highlighted that suppliers did not know or failed to report on how they were compromised. So one of the biggest things we find is that when someone, they need to prepare for the inevitable. And when someone does um, find that they're breached, then how do we recover from that? So it's inevitable that one day you will get breached, but the response time to recover your operation, um, to recover financial loss, and obviously come back online on a technical perspective um, is really key. Um, so often we find that suppliers don't even know that. So the length of time to recover is much, much longer. So we're just going to move on um, and talk about how can supply chain cyber threats impact your business. Um, and I think this is probably something that business owners, um, strategic advisors, um, and people really looking at improving business from a strategy level should be concerned about. So things like loss of data, downtime to business critical systems and applications, operations grinding to a halt, loss of revenue and increased health and safety risks. Obviously, given the industry, health and safety is high on the agenda. Um, and, and really, when that's posing a risk, that's ultimately going to risk your employees. Um, and also, your day-to-day -day operation, someone has to manage that problem and, and report on that and, and provide audits of how you've mitigated that. So it really does cause huge, huge problems if you're unable to access systems or you're seeing the wrong information within your systems because they've been manipulated. So it's really considering not just the health and safety aspect, but the information you're seeing to recover from that as well. So just on that, Jeremy, it'd be great to sort of see your thoughts and, and what other threats we should maybe consider as well. Um, uh, around things like uh, data loss and, and downtime to do business critical systems and applications, what we're seeing is a lot of uh, ransomware attacks going on, especially within supply chains uh, to your a point in your earlier slide around uh, developers uh, generally tend to have elevated privileges and access. And this is a common vector of uh, exploitation uh, through spear phishing attacks, what have you, in order to gain uh, privileged access through back doors, utilizing uh, developer systems uh, as their primary means of input. Uh, that could be through uh, two-factor authentication prompt bombing or uh, just simply uh, spear phishing attacks that come through email, uh, a developer unwittingly clicks on a, a link, and before you know it, uh, they have unleashed some uh, malware, some ransomware uh, into the environment. So it's important that you have a lot of checks and balances in place to ensure that, again, 
that those developers do not have access to anything that they shouldn't have, but also to check and validate and verify that the systems that they're utilizing um, are fully in compliance with uh, your security best practices. This means things like you have uh, you know, antivirus installed, you have some uh, uh, data leak protection software installed on that, uh, anti-malware, uh, anti anti-ransomware, uh, et cetera, and that they're unable to access any, any critical resources within the environment uh, without those certain checks and balances in place to ensure that their device is compliant, that it is, uh, that it is utilizing a business system and then perhaps you know, maybe not a, a personally owned machine uh, that could have uh, other types of malware installed on it. Uh, because that will significantly reduce your risks to your business and to your ulti ultimately to your supply chain. And uh, regardless of how that access is conducted, whether that's through a remote access VPN to a SaaS based system or, or to on-prem systems, uh, whether or not it's what the, the machine that they use to sit down at their desk and connect to the wired network or to the wireless network, you wanna make sure that that system is 100% safe and clean uh, before it is granted access onto the network. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I, I think a few things to pick up on there. When we look at loss of revenue, um, what organizations should understand is that each cyber breach, and if you were to breach, whether that's on a data level, whether that's on an infrastructure level, there's a direct correlation to the cost of that. And that depends on a few things in terms of the size of your organization, uh, the number of the head count, and also who's responsible for that. So we see time and time again, data protection officers go into court and they're really held responsible for breaches, whether that's information that's stolen, whether that's a breach that's come into your infrastructure because you didn't have a vulnerability patched. Those sort of issues can lead to um, legal battles and also people ultimately being held accountable. So I think for your organization, speaking to peers in the industry, speaking to experts, and this is where we really tried to help organizations is, is directly correlate that loss of revenue to the size of your organization, and then really build a roadmap off the back of that to reduce that over time. Um, and, and really it's, it's a difficult one because as business owners or people who are non-technical, really understanding where you take that forward, there's so many technologies out there, this map of loss of revenue to your business will then allow you to budget for that and build out on that roadmap going forward. But I think the point you raised around ransomware, that really links into our next slide, which is really gonna show how big companies, even, no matter what size company you are, it's not always you that's the target. If someone within your supply chain is at risk and they are infected by ransomware, for example, or malware, then that's ultimately, if your defenses on the in, outside and also on the inside aren't in place, then that problem is going to come to you at some point as well. So I think it's a really key point there to understand that the revenue element of this, it, it does directly map to every business and there will always be a risk there. So we're just going to talk about Maersk. I'm sure everyone has heard of Maersk um, at some point. Um, one of the biggest shipping freight companies in the world. Um, and a few years back, they were on the headlines for one of the biggest cyber breaches ever reported. So I'm just gonna quickly run through what that looked like. And then hopefully as we sort of go through this webinar, it's something to relate to and to understand how that happened, how that happened to them and what that sequence of event looked like. So what happened with Maersk? So, there was a vulnerability called Eternal Blue, which was a Microsoft vulnerability, um, which was discovered many years ago. And what that vulnerability essentially caused problems was to one of Maersk's supply chain partners. The problem was that Maersk also had the same problem and also didn't take Microsoft's recommendation to patch and upgrade their systems. So when we look at what happened here, the supplier was infected with ransomware at one of their shipping ports um, within Ukraine. And that all that came from was a single PC at a port location that was physically connected to and infected with ransomware. Um, and ultimately that spread globally throughout Maersk's network, 
um, and also other MERS partner networks as well. So it wasn't just those that were affected, it was actually the entire supply chain. And that really turned a corner for those um, as a business and as a supply chain to really think about things differently. And ultimately what that was down to was a lack of process, mindset, the wrong mindset, and also the technology not in place. So what happened there? They were offline for three days. That affected 50,000 endpoints, and that could be anything from laptops, RF scanners, printers, anything that requires a connection was effectively um, part of that. There were 600 sites globally, um, and that was within 133 countries, 130, sorry. And the total cost of that breach was between two to 300 million. Um, however, the cost is actually expected to be much more than that because the cost, the total cost of the breach also had in question their supply chain partners as well, which was also in the hundreds of millions. So even though the reports say this, that was actually much greater. Um, but Maersk obviously got heavily impacted directly. Um, if their um, external uh, defenses was very much secure, then they could have been excluded from that vulnerability and probably helped other supply chain partners as well, which they interface to. So what can be done to reduce, so what can be done, sorry, to reduce the impact if anything was to happen? So there's a few things that I wanna raise here, is, is always be prepared. So like I said, when the, the inevitable happens, you have the defenses, the processes, the policies, the people and the technology to react to that. Do the simple things right. Often people feel this, this overwhelming feeling that they have to look at these complex solutions, maybe like MDR or cloud security solutions, which cost lots of money. These are the basic things that we can do right. Things from email security, we can now leverage AI heavily through sandboxing. Um, we've got things like network access control, which I'm sure Jeremy can give an insight into what that's doing to reduce impact. Um, and cyber attacks don't discriminate. Whether you're a large organization, medium or small, cyber criminals don't consider this. They start with the more basic attacks, so spam email, um, looking at those endpoints that aren't protected, so bring your own device. If people haven't got those policies in place, nobody controls personal devices. So you as a corporation need to adopt something like mobile device management. And also control movement, which again, I think Portnox as a network access control solution is really addressing. So once an attacker is beyond your external defenses, lateral movement within your infrastructure is almost inevitable. And this is where role-based access decreases the risk of where they can access. So for example, me as admin staff, I might need to access a file server. Um, I might need to access accountancy software, but I can't access the domain controller, which controls the entire organization. Um, I can't access the network equipment, which provides connectivity to wireless, which then serves our RF scanning infrastructure in warehouses. Um, so it's these things that we need to think about in the short term and also the long term then look to build on that and look at MDR solutions, look at simulation tools that we can use to really see if our defenses are up to scratch. But just on that, Jeremy, is there anything else that you feel like business owners and strategic people in businesses can start thinking about how they can reduce the impact when that happens to them, hopefully not soon, but in the inevitable future, I guess. Well, in your Maersk example, uh, I think it uh, follows the proverb that an, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So for probably 1% or less of what it costs them in the end to, be, uh, to recover from the exploitation, they could have prevented all of that. Um, there's a, a litany of things that I'm sure they could have done better, uh, but just simply following your security best practices, things like main, managing and maintaining your Windows updates uh, on your on your critical systems on all of your endpoints, but also uh, ensuring that those devices that your uh, end users are utilizing are also properly managed and maintained with EDR software and, and, and patch management, et cetera. And if they aren't, 
then they simply do not allow them to access uh, your network in any way, shape, or form, either wirelessly, or wirely, uh, from a wired network, or from the VPN. Place them in a quarantine VLAN temporarily so that they can get into compliance if necessary, or just outright deny them access uh, entirely. Yeah, no, you're totally right, and I think the compliance element is very important. When we look at cyber threats across the board, where I feel like companies can, can really get a hold on that is one, to have visibility, to have control and be able to remediate. And really what a network access solution does is allows you to do all of that in a single pane of glass. So I think that's something that every organization should consider. Um, it's not a product that's only fit to large companies. And I think what's great really is about Portnox is that we can leverage the SaaS functionality. So if you're a smaller company or a medium company and your IT team is quite small or your security team is small, then a lot of that is actually built into what you get from a, a product like Portnox. So when we talk about um, SaaS products, that's essentially taking all of the utilities away from you. So the power, the cooling, the electricity, all of that is built into the sub subscription that you pay for. Um, that's no longer your um, problem to manage. Um, and then ongoing security as well. So you can, you can sleep at night knowing that that product is patched every month or every week. Um, and any vulnerabilities are also um, dealt with immediately. And really ongoing security is much, much less of a concern. So I think the SaaS model is really great. Um, and I think that's definitely the future. Um, obviously, there's, there's other things to consider there, but I think it is really great that overheads are also drastically reduced because often or not, cyber is an overhead and people have their day jobs, they have their operation to run. Cyber is often a part of that, that especially non-technical people don't want to consider um, and waste time on. So I had a similar conversation um, earlier on today, and it was great to see other companies really developing a proactive approach, but also rewarding their staff for doing cyber training. So if they have a simulation product and they kick, uh, click on um, an email, which is a phishing email, that then sends them into a training module to upskill them. And by doing that, they get rewards and they see an incentive there. So I think that's really important around being proactive. Um, as just another thing to add, really, to reduce the impact of when things happen. So how to proactively improve resilience to supply chain risk? Obviously, we've talked about where's the risk, how can it impact us? But now we're going to look at how we can, just going off the bat of what I just said, is proactively improve that. So quite a number of things here to talk through. So. I'm going to just go through this quite quickly, um, but if there's anything else that you want to add to that, Jeremy, once I've gone through this, then, then please do. It'd um, be great to hear your thoughts on that. Um, but ask your suppliers those difficult questions. Sometimes when you have good relationships with people, that should encourage you to ask them, have you got the processes and policies in place? What technologies are you using? And do that often as well, because the cyber landscape is, is ever developing. Um, not one day is the same, and, and hackers are becoming more sophisticated. So that ongoing dialogue to ask them where they're at in their journey is really going to help you become more confident in working with them, and also for other people to have those conversations with you and know that you're having those open conversations with suppliers to fundamentally reduce the risk ongoingly and not just now and in the future. And focus on the gateway to your infrastructure. So although we've talked about internal security and lateral movement, also don't forget that the external, so the internet is the focus for entering into your network. This is one of the highest risks, the internet. Um, so think about things like VPN, um, invest in firewall technology. It doesn't have to be um, top tier vendors, you can have basic level protection from lower tier vendors, but understand what that cost looks like. And it's also a trade off between cost and also security and what that provides you. So I think the gateway is definitely something to invest in and to understand what features. So when we look at 
next generation firewalls? Is it URL filtering that you need to focus on? And that's where you've seen problems occur. Is it problems with the policies that you're able to implement? There's so many different elements to next generation firewalls that we really need to understand before making that investment. Penetration testing. There's so many different types of penetration testing. And this is essentially for people who aren't aware of what this is, is this is actually a hacker that comes into your network or into your organization. And based on the type of penetration test, whether it's on your website, whether it's on your network, um, it could be on different areas of your IT infrastructure, that hacker or um, certified ethical hacker comes in and tries to breach your defenses. And off the back of that, builds a report that allows you to then move forward um, and fix those problems and ultimately risks ongoingly. Going back to what I said in terms of asking your suppliers those difficult questions, audit them, set risk assessments on, on the physical and virtual um, side as well. So physical, go to their premises, understand what physical security they've got. We've seen with Maersk, that was all that was a combination, I guess, but really where that sourced from was a physical, um, I guess, door that was open and really someone was able to gain access and then on the virtual software side, then take advantage of the vulnerabilities that's there. Honeypots, we see these used quite often and these essentially are traps for hackers to really for you to report on and then build off the back of that. Um, into technology solutions that solve those problems. Look at accreditations to start your business uh, moving forward with providing reassurance to your customer base, your supply chain, and also senior management, Cyber Essentials, Cyber Essentials Plus, and really for us, the framework, which is ISO 27001. And what we would recommend is if you're looking at whether you should do Cyber Essentials or ISO 27001. It's really important to note that Cyber Essentials is, is a checklist of have you got these solutions, these defenses, these, these processes in place. However, ISO 27001 is a framework and that needs to be adopted from the entire company. So it's not something that the technical team just do. Every single person in that organization needs to adopt the processes and policies to provide data loss, um, to provide ongoing management of security, and really the right products for you to become secure. Uh, network access control, as, as we mentioned, Portnox. Um, they've got the likes of Portnox, which provide a cloud-based network access control, but there's also um, on-premise solutions out there as well. Um, we've got remote monitoring and management tools like RMM Enable. Um, so they're a branch off of SolarWinds and that allows you to do remote monitoring and patching of both on-premise and cloud infrastructure. Threat intelligence. And this is really, from our perspective, something that we find medium to large companies tend to inherit. Um, but things like MDR, EDR, and this is essentially um, a security operations center for you wrapped in a solution. So the likes of Sophos, Alert Logic, these providers are providing a completely managed service, which us as NetSec work closely with these guys and we help integrate that into your network um, to really manage and detect and respond as it says simply that. And then also endpoint detection if endpoints are within your network that shouldn't be there, how do we remediate that and remove them? Mobile device management, that's something that we've mentioned, the likes of AirWatch, um, they really provide compliance to mobile devices throughout your organization. So I think that's something that's often forgotten about. Um, laptops, tablets, these are mainly the focus, but mobiles, they, one of the most commonly used devices in the technology space. And I guess in general, most people have a mobile device and that's where the targets are now becoming, whether that's on banking apps or personal data, that's all held on these devices. And you as a corporation are responsible for that when that relates to doing business um, and really everyday um, operational work. Fishing simulators and really simulators as a whole 
Um, we see vendors like SimSpace, which are working with the FBI globally. They're going into MOD, government, because essentially, how do you as an organization know that you've got the technology in place to protect you if anything was to happen? And what a simulator does is essentially reenacts how an attacker would come into your network. And then it gives you a report and remediation of how you, how you prevent that in the future. And when we look at phishing simulators, the companies like Fished, where they provide inbuilt training to that and really try and develop better behavior from employees. So if I click on a link, it would then tell me that that link doesn't look normal for these specific reasons, whether it's the domain that's been rewritten or whether it's the individual signature that's been rewritten. And then it builds that into a training module, which you then, as a manager or I guess a business owner, is then responsible for ensuring that your staff are trained ongoingly. And then as that progresses, behavior changes. And then we start to get things where we feel like something's not right. And that's then a development from just ultimately clicking on something. You're now looking at an email, which then you think there's something not right about this. And that's where we need to get to and ultimately report those ongoingly. And that again is a drastic reduction in the risk to your business. And then lastly, AI and sandbox solutions. This sort of links into um, the threat intelligence and phishing. Um, we're seeing a lot of use, um, especially from things like chat GPT, as I'm sure everyone knows. Um, but AI is essentially leveraging that. Um, that type of action, and that's built into solutions then to, to learn these behaviors and then mimic that within a sandbox so you can essentially see that that behavior is not right and it would remediate that automatically for you. I guess as part of that, before we move on, Jeremy, um, is there anything else that you feel like people need to proactively think about in terms of improving resilience to the supply chain? Well, quite, to be quite honest, I'm sure this list probably seems a bit overwhelming to a lot of the attendees. Um, there's probably a handful, maybe more, uh, of these items that they're not, not doing today and maybe not able to do today. But this is actually one of the greatest benefits to uh, fact-based delivery, which is that you can get in, someone else can do this for you, provide that service to you uh, with very little to no effort on your part. Um, also, it's great to leverage MSSPs if you are a small organization utilizing something like, uh, you know, so uh, enables uh, RMM capabilities as well as the rest of their product portfolio to help uh, prop up or uh, fill in the gaps in those security uh, holes that you might have that uh, need coverage. Because these are all excellent examples of things uh, that would be tremendous benefits to any organization of literally any size. Uh, but it can seem a little daunting and overwhelming to those uh, small and mid-sized companies. How can I possibly do all of this stuff? And that's where you leverage SaaS and uh, uh, managed service providers, managed security uh, service providers to, to aid in those, um, those customers. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and we feel like as part of educating through the likes of these webinars, we really want to develop that relationship with companies to feel like they've got a strategic support partner that's with them every step of the way um, is very much daunting for a lot of people, especially starting on that journey. Um, and really having experts alongside you to guide you, even if it's on advice level, um, really is important. It's great to see so many um, groups now starting where we see the likes of CIOs, um, DPOs, information security managers, now reaching out and building groups so they can educate each other. Um, but also then on a professional level, to, you know, for us to really look at your organization, see where the risks are, and then map that to the technology that's going to suit you. Because what fits one company and where their risks are, are going to be completely different for another, whether that's in the same industry or not. Every company is at a different point in that journey, and every company has different budgets to support that. So. It's that bespoke approach that we feel like because we see different companies at different points in that journey, we can best advise them on where they need to take that next. But yeah, it's a great point and it's sometimes difficult to um, include everything, but we like to include 
as much as possible. And, and sometimes these things, they're quick wins when we look at penetration testing. That can be done over a number of days. Um, asking your suppliers those difficult questions, that's something that doesn't cost. You can build out a basic checklist on that. But once you're educated, you can ask the right questions. And, and just to, I guess, start to wrap things up, and, and I think it's really been useful for me to see what your perspective is on things. So hopefully that's obviously been useful for everyone else um, on the webinar. But really, what, what can business owners going forward, what can they adopt from a business, um, an operational mindset, I guess, when working within a supply chain, what's going to make them successful and ultimately become better at managing cyber risk and also supply chain risk associated with that? I think you touched on, uh, I'm going to point back to my previous comments, which is uh, leverage, uh, leverage SaaS-based services where you where possible and where uh, appropriate. Uh, some of the things that you mentioned around like ISO 27001, like that is something that uh, we and many other SaaS-based organizations will bring to the table with us, that we are providing a service that is already ISO 27001 certified. Penetration testing, you can certainly go out and get your own uh, you know, ethical hacker to come in on a periodic basis, annually or otherwise, to, to perform penetration testing. But it's hard to, uh, it's hard to keep pace with those in the SaaS-based uh, organizations where uh, we ourselves, we conduct penetration literally on a daily basis. Every single day, multiple times a day, we are continuously probing our environment uh, and uh, our product uh, for potential vulnerabilities and uh, reacting and responding in kind. And these are the types of things that some organ many organizations, if not all organizations, are unable to fulfill at scale. So if you are able to outsource that where, where you can to a SaaS-based service, then that is a tremendous, of a tremendous benefit to you and your organization. SaaS-based services are inherently more secure than something that you would traditionally run and deploy on-prem because you are not having to uh, keep a watchful eye out for what vulnerabilities uh, the, it may exist within the product itself and uh, have to schedule a potential change window and, uh, and implement those uh, changes on a Saturday. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot to do for one system now scale that across the tens, twenties, thirties, hundreds, possibly even thousands of different systems that you might have running in your environment. Uh, and it's a daunting, overwhelming task that uh, most organizations are not capable of keeping up with. Uh, so that's that's ultimately uh, a, one of my key and primary recommendations. Um, and again, to, to leverage uh, uh, ser managed service providers, uh, MSSPs uh, where appropriate, um, if your organization is small enough and doesn't have the resources or skill sets necessary in order to secure your environment uh, and keep it well protected. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And I, I think that that proactiveness, which you can leverage from SaaS um, and also automation of that as well. So although maybe that's a manual process to the SaaS provider, you as a customer don't have to worry about those things on the weekends. So that's ultimately a task which is reducing cyber risk that's now automated. Um, and as I think that market grows and SaaS is becomes, I guess, one of the leading um, solutions really in terms of how organizations can access things more cost effectively, leverage automation and also reduce overheads. I think for me, that's, that's a great um, selling point. And, and I, I think it's definitely the future. So if we look at um, just a few points that we feel like we need to address um, and really try and educate in terms of how you can take the right mindset going forward. So think if your suppliers aren't safe, you aren't safe. So just because you spend lots of um, financial and also your own time to become secure, all of the things that we discussed, you could be doing all of that, but ultimately if your supply chain is at risk, um, similar to we've seen with Maersk, yes, the risk on your side is, is definitely reduced, but also that doesn't mean that you're safe. And ongoingly, that's gonna make your life harder because you have to continually adopt, um, optimize your tools, and really remain more vigilant when you as a company have invested in that. Align supply chain management process to business cyber strategy so how you manage those suppliers 
as we've said, having those awkward conversations or either those difficult questions when we're trying to determine whether you want to work with someone in the supply chain and make sure that that's part of your business. I guess strategy as a whole, but really focus that within um, the cyber strategy as well. How products and services are built, for example, where code or raw materials are developed. I think understanding that, um, where they're being sourced from, we see lots of problems with products or, or even code, which is, is developed by manufacturers in the likes of China or Russia. And whether that's one, two, three or five steps away within your supply chain, that's ultimately a risk. Don't only secure the perimeter, like we've said, it's that um, analogy I like to, to use is don't have a hard shell and a soft belly. So when someone's into your network, that's still a risk to your business. So look at the likes of network access control, which can limit that lateral movement and anything else in terms of detecting and remediating that, whether that's MDR or EDR, those products really are trying to stop that perimeter once that's breach becoming a problem. And also control and visibility. We say this is your best friend when we look at cyber risks, because if you can control that attack and also have visibility of it, that ultimately allows you to remediate it and recover your business as fast as possible. So any tools or solutions that provide control and visibility, make sure that you have those in place, even if that's on a basic level, because as we've saw a high number of reports show that most people don't even know that they've been um, infiltrated by a hacker um, and really that can cause long-term pain. Whereas this is almost short-term pain to implement that solution, do your market research, work with specialists in the industry. But then once that's in place, you can sleep at night knowing that if something happens, at least you can see it and then remediate it as quickly as possible. So we really just want to show the companies that we're currently working with, um, who we've helped in the past, and really just to, to show that these companies are really adopting that cyber first approach. And it's really great to see. So the likes of, of Gregory, they're doing some really exciting things with new technology, Evo Group, uh, Debenhams, which is now Boohoo, um, Estee Lauder, OSI, Shawbrook Bank, and the list goes on and, and these companies really have, have worked with us in recent years and really taken that step into that um, and built out a roadmap and, and really reaped the rewards. And, and they continually do that. Um, you know, when we go back to, to looking at the training element or the proactiveness, it's not just something that you, you do and, and forget about it. This needs to be something that you continually adopt and slowly chip away at it because the risk is ever going to grow if you don't make that start. So I think that's probably enough of me speaking. Jeremy, um, really appreciate you jumping on. Um, is there anything else you want to sort of add before we just wrap up and see if anyone wants to ask any questions to me or yourself? No, I just wanted to thank you and uh, everyone for the opportunity to uh, be here today. So thank you. No, it's been great. And hopefully I think, you know, we continue seeing Port Knox um, up here in the UK. I think you guys are doing some great things. Um, it's really just through these webinars, we're looking to deliver value and really help you realize maybe where you are in the roadmap and what you need to think about going forward. And I think it's a difficult one because nobody really knows where they are in that journey. Um, but this is really being aware of what's next for you as a company and maybe where you need to take that. And, and by us showing you these different technologies, or even referencing these examples like Maersk and what really happens to companies like that, then hopefully we can educate you and really help you make that, that next decision in, in your cyber journey.